Good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Stefano Raboli speaking. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce today the first uh, digital event from the St. Moritz Gallery. The title of uh, the exhibition is a Scene Touch. It is an exhibition that opened on the 25th of September and will remain visible until the 15th of November. The exhibition was curated by Giorgia von Albertini that today will be with us and she will be uh, introducing the works in a conversation with uh, Marco Senaldi. Giorgia von Albertini is a curator, an uh, uh, independent curator based in Zurich and in the Engadin Valley. And I'm delighted to uh, uh, introduce uh, Georgia, who will be leading us through a tour. Thank you, Georgia. Hi, everybody. So I'm really happy that uh, Marco Senaldi, who is an Italian philosopher specialized in contemporary art, specifically uh, Marcel Duchamp and Manzoni, is joining us today for this um, walkthrough. Um, the exhibition is entitled Seeing Touch and the conceptual point of departure for the exhibition was an essay by Helen Rose's work entitled Duchamp by Kant Even. So this essay was really groundbreaking and seminal because for the first time, um, Helen Molesworth shed light on the sort of handmade nature of some of Duchamp's work versus his ready mains So that sort of opens up a whole universe and it also opens up the possibility of understanding the anti-retinal in a new way. So while the anti-retinal is commonly understood to be a sort of antidote to the visual, um, Helen Molesworth invites us to understand the anti-retinal not as something that is opposed to the visual, but as something that sort of goes beyond the visual. So precisely this beyond the visual is um, the leading topic of the exhibition. Um, there are various artists present in this exhibition. The works span from the 1960s to today. And the focal points are really words that bring about sort of tactile or effective responses in the viewer. So words um, that make us understand that seeing is not just a purely sort of rational or mechanic mechanism, but that seeing is really transformative. So here is a Sculptures by Malvita, sculptures by Anna Maria Marino, a wall piece by Martin Soto Clement. Um, on this opposite, opposite wall, there are two works by Sylvie Fleury that she made using fake fur. Another sculpture. Um, by Nantitao. And here we have uh, three albums by the Italian artist uh, Piero Manzoni. All these three albums date from between 1960 and 1961. And these albums were really a sort of important um, part of the exhibition, um, Manzoni was an extremely innovative and forward-thinking artist who was part of the Italian avant-garde. He is best known for his acromes, and these are, as you can see, works that are characterized by their lack of color and were conceptualized by the artist to be a sort of total space. And I find it very interesting that the lack of color or the lack of sign or gesture in these works really enables us as a viewer to sort of focus on the pure materiality of these works. And as you can see, especially with this work, which is a cloud of uh, fiberglass, these works really appeal to our sense of touch. And in fact, uh, Manzoni was very much interested in the space of the viewer and he sort of understood the space of the spectator to be 
one of the most inter interesting spaces of the art of his time. So as Marco is amongst other things, a Manzoni specialist, I'd be really interested to hear from you, Marco, um, what the sort of socio, political or cultural backdrop was in Italy at the time, at the beginning of the 1960s, when Manzoni worked on these art forms. Uh, hi, Georgia. Good afternoon. And uh, um, compliments for, uh, for uh, your uh, beautiful exhibition. Uh, and, um, and about Manzoni, and about Manzoni, a chrome, uh, especially th that a chrome made uh, of fiberglasses, uh, we, we, we should not uh, forget that uh, it was uh, uh, made uh, uh, in Italy during the 60s. That is uh, 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 a period, uh, the historical period in, in the history of Italy uh, of, of uh, um, uh, 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 um, uh, economically speaking, uh, extremely important, uh, called uh, the, the economic miracle. And uh, during this uh, era, uh, uh, artists as Manzoni were uh, thrilled, were, were enthusiastic, uh, uh, immersed in the, in the atmosphere of that period. And uh, uh, Manzoni was uh, interested in the the, 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 the use of new materials as uh, fiberglass, for instance. Uh, not, not, uh, uh, we, should, we should recall also that uh, in the 60s, uh, uh, an, an Italian inventor, Giulio Natta, uh, won the Nobel Prize for inventing the polymer, the, basically plastic. So it was a fantastic period of uh, innovations. Uh, uh, scientific uh, advancement uh, and so on and so on and and uh, Manzoni uh, talks us uh, of this period but also um, there is uh, something uh, ironic uh, a subtle uh, irony in his uh, works and uh, he, he once says that uh, for him uh, the artist uh, was uh, as a uh, um, as a, a fisherman, no? who, who uh, uh, take by the hook the viewer, and uh, this is uh, uh, the, the case. You no, know? we, we, we would like uh, the, the title, uh, Georgia. You gave your uh, accrochage, your exhibition is the uh, same touch. In, in fact, uh, we would like to touch this material, the cotton, the, the fiberglass, uh, but it's not uh, possible. So. We are uh, 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 driven uh, by the desire to touch uh, and uh, the impossibility to, to touch. Uh, this, this I loved how you just uh, described Manzoni as a fisherman that sort of really takes us by the hook. Um, in a previous conversation that we had, you also really described Manzoni as somebody who sort of produced ideas. And maybe that brings yeah. us to the next work that I'd like to discuss with you, which is Manzoni's project entitled Lines. Um, this is a very sort of utopian project that started um, at a newspaper mill in Denmark. So there uh, Manzoni was using very long strips of paper and sort of painted lines on paper. And one of the lines was, I think up to 7,200 meters long. And the way I see it, this project is a sort of further step towards the disappearance of the artwork in Manzoni's oeuvre. Um, as you can see on the slide, the, these lines were presented in sort of cylindrical containers that were closed. So only the mind's eye could sort of visualize the work, but there was no direct um, visibility of the work. So for me, this again sort of puts the emphasis on the role of the spectator and on the role of uh, imagination. So I'd be interested to hear from you, Marco, um, what your sort of understanding is of this very utopian project, but also what you think the role of the container is in Manzoni's work more broadly. 
uh, Georgia, I'm 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 uh, very happy uh, to speak about Manzoni today, uh, and uh, I'm happy, <laughs> so happy you you put Manzoni at the beginning of your uh, uh, of your uh, 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 journey uh, through the Seeing uh, Touch uh, exhibition. It's uh, very important because Manzoni for us for us Italian, uh, he was uh, really really a pioneer in a way, no? And uh, well, uh, the 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 fact that to use a box, uh, probably uh, we, we may think uh, to the, the La Boite en Valise, uh, the box uh, in the sweet, sweet case uh, by Duchamp. But uh, here, uh, uh, goes on uh, because um, the, the, the line is, uh, is an idea of, of painting. The painting reduced to, to basically a, 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 the most simple sign, a line. And uh, to put a line into uh, a box uh, to conceal it uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, to transform it into a, a, a second time into an idea. So it, it's an, an idea into an idea in a way, you know. And in fact, and in fact Piero Manzoni once uh, uh, de describing himself uh, he said, "I basically I am a seller of ideas. I sell ideas, which is fantastic for me as a philosopher. I, I would like to be myself a seller of ideas if, if, I, if I could. <laughs> that, 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 that is uh, so. Uh, what we have, uh, 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 notwithstanding, we we are in front of an object uh, with the label." Uh, uh, no, uh, it's a, a, a beautiful object. So the fact of these lines being boxed in these uh, cylindrical containers and the whole idea of the container also brings us to another project of Manzoni, which is um, Merda d'Artista that he executed in May hmm. 1961. So this project consisted of 90 cans filled with the artist's shit and the price of this work was calculated in accordance with the daily exchange rates of gold. So for me, of course, this is a sort of humorous reflection on the role of the artist's body in contemporary art, but also on the role of consumer goods and perhaps capitalism more generally. Um, how do you interpret this work or how do you sort of read the visual language of this work, both sort of in conjunction to Italy at the time, but also in conjunction to what was going on in art at the time or even before that. So I would also be interested to hear your thoughts on how maybe this work by Manzoni shows some parallels with Duchamp's urinal. Uh, yes, yes. But uh, you you may imagine, uh, Georgia, how much I I, I love this uh, this beautiful uh, this beautiful master. For me, it's a real uh, masterpiece. No, no, it it not uh, not inferior to to Duchamp uh, fountain. Uh, exactly. Uh, once uh, uh, Duchamp uh, said about uh, to a, uh, in a, during an interview uh, that uh, the fountain. Uh, the, the urinal uh, was uh, uh, a test, a test to explore the limits of what of the uh, uh, of the taste of the viewer. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's right, uh, and also artist sheet, merda artista is more or less the same, or or better, uh, something. Uh, uh, more uh, uh, radically in a way because it explores the, the limits of our uh, tolerance uh, also in terms of of uh, of, of, uh, of freedom of speech uh, uh, you know that uh, um, today still today uh, the, the the word merda <laughs> is uh, we we may use uh, uh, today uh, uh, no uh, 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 in this afternoon, uh, quite uh, quite freely because uh, we are uh, uh, no in in a context uh, very high in the gallery, <laughs> you and me speaking and so on. But uh, you can you may imagine that uh, 
for instance, uh, during a, a, a prime time show on TV, uh, it's not, it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's con uh, uh, they consider um, incorrect uh, or completely uh, to use uh, this, uh, this word. So, uh, Merda d'Artista by Manzoni uh, uh, real is a test, uh, uh, even today, uh, to test uh, how how much uh, we are free to speak uh, to 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 talk about uh, artist shit. It is mm -hmm. a uh, no, you you know, it is an idea in the end, uh, an idea as a uh, line and also the acrom uh, uh, you have uh, in your beautiful exhibition. It is of course in every case a sort of radical artwork that tests both sort of the boundaries of the viewer or the buyer, as well as the boundaries of what art can be, um, which maybe leads us to another project of Manzoni that I'd also like to discuss with you, which is his egg performance or the consumption of art that he staged in 1960. So this performance consisted of Manzoni boiling some eggs and then signing them with the imprint of his finger that he had dipped in ink before that, and then serving them to the public for the public to eat. And he himself also ate one of these signed eggs. So in a way, this performance is sort of reminiscent of, I don't know, a mystical communion, but at the same time, it also might be understood as the sort of total disappearance of the artwork because not only A, he declares a signed egg to be the artwork, but then B, the egg disappears as it is eaten. And so does sort of Manzoni's imprint and signature. So I'd be interested um, to hear what your thoughts on this seminal performance are, Marco. Uh, yes. Uh the disappearance, the devouring of art, Divorare l'arte was, was the title of that performance. It, uh, before uh, uh, the, we have the disappearance of, uh, of, uh, of color in the acrom, no? acrom, without any chroma, any color. And then uh, the, uh, it, it is uh, the artwork uh, in total completely that di disappeared. But, uh, uh, I, I remember the dis distinction that uh, Jean Baudrillard once uh, uh, told to, to me, uh, talking uh, in an afternoon, uh, and he told me, Marco, that there is a big difference between uh, uh, the nothing and the disappear into nothing. The nothing is the, the void, the, the, the negative, the, 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 the absence. And uh, to disappear uh, means that there is a, a movement, uh, something uh, that was uh, and uh, that uh, was was not yet uh, now. And uh, and um, and uh, I remember uh, uh, another definition Manzoni um, uh, give uh, give give of, of himself uh, as uh, Mister Nothing. I am a Mr. Nothing. That, that, that's beautiful, though. No? Uh, but uh, he was able to uh, um, e extract basically anything out of nothing. So the nothing is a nothing full of possibilities. And uh, the fact that the, the, the viewers, the people in the gallery eat uh, uh, the eggs uh, seen by Maroni means that. Uh, the, the artwork uh, di disappear. The dematerialization of the artwork, you know, in the term of uh, Lucy Lippard, uh, 1972. But uh, uh, but uh, they 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 really become art. Life become art. That that's uh, that's uh, the 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 idea of Mr. Manzoni, Mister Nothing. You know, <laughs> George. Yeah, thank I, you. For I don't this. know if you agree. <laughs> I I think it's absolutely um, interesting that sort of by means of Baudrillard, you accentuate that disappearance always has to do with existence in a way. So only something that previously exists and has been acknowledged in its statues can disappear, which was absolutely the case um, with this egg devouring performance. So 
Um, now, as we are about to speak about uh, Dita Oth and Filida Barlow, I'm afraid uh, Stefano and I have to disappear into the elevator for a moment to reach the first floor of the exhibition, which is sort of the second half of it. Thank you so much for doing this with us, Marco. I'm really super thrilled and pleased to have you as a conversation thank, partner. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Even if uh, this, uh, this uh, a, a little bit strange uh, way to, to, to meet each other is a little bit uh, complicated, but it's very interesting. It, it is exciting in a way because- the, Yeah, everything is virtual is now. Touch. Exactly, it's a visual. <laughs> so we, we, we are in contact uh, without the contact. Exactly. That's, that's the best for you, Georgia. Georgia, it's the best for you, no? It's, 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 in a way, it yeah. Is a, the, the, it is a, yeah, no? Yeah, so I'm pleased to give you a virtual tour of the second um, part of the exhibition. On this floor, we have works by Dita Vold. Two sculptures by Filida Ballo, as well as by Simone Fatal over here on this pedestal. Um, we have a wall installation by Dita Wald, two sculptures by Alina Shapovnikov, and then works. Georgia, I've seen on the wall uh, uh, three strange. Uh, uh, the cardboard. Of, three strange cardboard uh, exploded boxes uh, by <laughs> Dieter Roth. Yeah, so let us go back um, to these works. May, may, you, may you explain uh, something about uh, this cardboard? cardboard. Uh, with pleasure. I really love these works. Um, so Dieter Roth was um, a Swiss artist who sort of really pushed the boundaries of what art is and what art can be. He worked in a very sort of um, interdisciplinary kind of way as he did sculpture, performance, sound, painting and bookmaking. And he really sort of aimed at dissolving the boundaries between art and life, but also between materials and shapes. And I feel like this group of works so this group of works is called Kartonabfälle and dates from 86. And I feel like this group of works really shows us how the boundaries between materials and shapes can be dissolved because basically they consist of pure material. So they simply consist of sort of cardboard detritus from Roth's studio that he glued on a sort of cardboard passport tool and framed. So if we look closely on these cardboards, we see all sort of these traces of time. We see pieces of tape. We see small inscriptions or even indications on how the cardboard is supposed to be folded if it were to be used as a box. So this series of works for me was very crucial in thinking through the concept of the show because there are sort of two main factors that lead to tactile engagement. Um, one is materiality. And even with materiality, you can divide it in sort of two groups because one group are familiar materials that incite our sense of touch because we know them and because we are used to relate to them by means of touch. Um, the other category is sort of unorthodox material that we don't know when that does sort of spark our curiosity. And the third group is corporeality, but here we are really with the materiality and I feel like this group of works really relates to our sense of touch because we know cardboard so well, we are used to sort of touching, opening, closing, folding it and throwing it away. Um, it is a question. It is again question of, of boxes in a way. We were uh, yeah, exactly. We're before. with the container again. With the container. Yeah, absolutely. Here is another group of works um, by Peter Road. So 
this um, wall installation that he did with his son here uh, dates from 1986. It's called Back Cloth. And I feel like this work we really essentially sort of Rob's emphasis on process and also his emphasis on the space of the studio. So on the right hand side, you see a big duvet cover, so a textile um, that has been painted by Roth and that is sort of mounted on a stretcher and framed. You also see how at the lower end of the work, the duvet has a sort of life of its own and sort of exits the frame of the work basically. And then on the left hand side, you have two other components of the work, which are these two photographs that Roth intervened up on. So on these photographs, you can see the duvet cover in its sort of original environment, which is the artist's studio. And then Roth painted over the glass, especially on the lower version of it. So I feel like this work really emphasizes something that is crucial in Roth's work, which is the space of the studio as well as the sort of process Georgia, of making art. George, a question for you. Uh, the, the fact that uh, the duvet, uh, um, as, as, uh, um, it, yes, the, this in, in, the, in the lower side uh, is out of the, of the, of the, of the, the frame. Of the frame. The frame is, is a mistake or what? Well, I'm not Diderot, so I can't tell. <laughs> but I don't think it's a mistake. For me, it's a really amazing detail that makes the work yeah. even stronger because I think Roth's art sort of broke all boundaries anyway. Yeah. So this again is a sort of trespassing of boundaries, which I feel fits very well with Roth's yeah. art. A sense of and then I included something in our presentation, which is really for you, Marco, which is the series <laughs> by Dieter Roth that is called Literaturburst. Yes. Literaturburst. Sausage is uh, made from uh, books, uh, basically. Exactly. Uh, that's that's uh, uh, that's interesting. I I um, uh, fell into this work uh, assuming uh, some information about this uh, fantastic artist. Uh, that uh, also also Dieter Rota has something in common with uh, something in common with uh, Manzoni because uh, he entitled uh, um, an anthology of uh, his poems "Scheiße," that is "merda," uh, "merda," <laughs> shit, basically shit. So in 1970, 72, 74. So there is a, a sort of resonance. Uh, also, in the fact that, that Dieter Roth was a, a sort of, uh, uh, George, is, is, I'm correct, a sort of anarchist, uh, artist anarchist, uh, in a way. Yeah, you're yeah. absolutely correct. And I feel in yeah. looking at this Literaturbus series, there emerges also a sort of second similarity, perhaps, between the two, which is the use of labels. So each of these sausages is labeled yeah. with the title of the book and the name of the artist. So again, we find this process of labeling, we find this sort of very humorous way very humorous, to deal very, with things. Very, yes, very ironic. And uh, here we have something uh, more or less similar to something we usual eat. eat. Uh, and uh, uh, the merda also is a, is a, a box, a can uh, similar to uh, met, uh, in, 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 in canned, canned meat. You know? So yeah. there is. Uh, this sort of uh, analogies uh, and metaphors, uh, but uh, but uh, the, the 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 piece uh, on the on the on the right of the of the screen uh, is fantastic because it is an homage to the great philosopher uh, uh, Georg Friedrich Friedrich Hegel, and and the, it is uh, for me a beautiful idea. No, because it sounds like a mockery. But in my opinion, is more uh, more or less uh, the the basic idea uh, uh, under uh, the murder artista that is um, uh, Hegel himself uh, speaks about uh, the conjunction of the uh, sublime and the lowest, 
and that mm -hmm. is that is uh, that is philosophy that is murder artista and that is uh, this literature burst uh, no the literature the the the, the sublime uh, ideology uh, no of of romanticism of idea of uh, of novelist and uh, or philosophy in the case in the case of of uh, georg hegel and uh, and sausage, which is the the, the lowest, not the thing you you buy just to eat it when when you are hungry, and mm. that uh, that uh, for me it's fantastic. Yeah, oh, I also it's... think it's really fascinating, and I think sometimes, or something we might tend to forget, um, is that Dieter Roth and Pierre Manzoni are actually contemporaries and were born yeah. only three years apart from each other. Of course, Manzoni unfortunately died very young and does ceased to make work in the mid 60s. But still, I feel like in talking through these works with you, there emerged a lot of similarities. And, and the Georgia, and um, let's recall that uh, both did the beautiful uh, artist's books, uh, no? Uh, Manzoni, the fantastic books uh, completely uh, Tra transparent uh, in plastic, transparent uh, life and works uh, by Piero Manzoni <laughs> with nothing, Mr. Nothing. And uh, Dieter Roth, uh, uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, artist books uh, with whole, uh, with uh, uh, no. Oh, it, it, that is also, we, we may consider literature worst uh, a sort of artist book in a, in a, in a way, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. So maybe to conclude our walkthrough, we can speak about these two sculptures by Filida Barlow that are part of the exhibition. Um, Filida Barlow was born a little after Piero Manzoni and Dieter Bode. She was born in 44. She's a, a British sculptor. Um, she's usually really known for her sort of monumental installation and her supersized sculptures. So often she works with materials that are pertinent to construction with very sort of rough materials, such as wood or cement, wire, foam, and textiles. Um, here in the exhibition, we have two smaller sculptures by her that are still sort of very characteristic of her practice. This sculpture here is titled Pronged Object Number Two and dates from 2013. It is made with plywood, cement, paint, wire netting, and this sort of expanding foam that we know from construction. Um, I have really been fascinated with Barlow's work for many reasons. So on the one hand, I'm interested in the materiality of the work because the sort of roughness of the material as well as its origin in construction um, sort of indicates sort of mutation or transformation of the work. And for me, this really coincides with how, as a viewer, we experience sculpture, because um, one always has to sort of walk around it. Um, the shape of sculpture really changes as we move through space as a viewer. Um, as, this uh, sculpture here. Looking, looking at to Looking to that uh, sculptures, uh, I, I can imagine uh, why uh, you uh, would like to introduce uh, Marlow in your uh, in your exhibition. I, I guess no, uh, the, the, it uh, drive us uh, to to the sense of touch. Absolutely. And then maybe if we look at the other sculpture that's on view, which is a sculpture from 2016. So this sculpture again has this sort of latent mobility or has evokes this sort of sense of mutation and transformation. And I was reading an essay by Brian Fair, who is an amazing um, art historian and writer, and I'd like to quote her in conjunction with this sculpture. So Brian Fair was um, writing on leftovers and the meaning of leftovers in sculpture. And she wrote, leftovers come to stand in not for what once has been, but for what will be. 
They suggest forever fluctuating possibilities. So I really like to think of this sort of unorthodox or perhaps cheap materials that Barlow uses not as a sort of sign of nostalgia, but as a sort of future facing kind of method. And this for me also very much coincides with the mobility that is inherent in these sculptures. Um, Barlow has repeatedly stated that the American comedian Buster Keaton has been of great influence to her. And she often speaks of Buster's absurd yet familiar incidents with objects or also of Chaplin's accidents. Um, and to Barlow, her sculptures are a sort of tipping point. And I think that's precisely why they seem so mutable and mobile. And it is also because of that, that they so much remind me of um, two works by the Swiss artist duo Fischli Weiss. Uh, one is entitled Stiller Nachmittag. Um, that is the work that you see on the left-hand side. It dates from 84, 85, and it consists of a series of images of sort of everyday quotidian objects that the artists arrange to form these equilibriums. And then a bit later in 87, they created a film that was called Der Lauf der Dinge, or The Way Things Go, in which the sort of movement or activation of one object led to the tipping of the other. Uh, in, in, uh, while I, I am uh, uh, hearing from uh, your introduction to your, uh, to your uh, exhibition, Georgia, I was uh, asking myself uh, if um, uh, a, a part of the central uh, issue about uh, seeing uh, such, uh, th there is an, a, a, a sub uh, issue, uh, which is the, the, the idea of leftover, of failure, of uh, discarded materials, uh, uh, re-employed. Uh, uh, also in Manzoni at the end, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the bread, the lebichette, uh, the, the cotton, uh, and uh, of course uh, in the Dieter Roth, uh, in Filida Barlow, in, uh, in uh, Fish and Weiss uh, photos and, uh, and videos. Uh, no, this idea, a, a little bit a, 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 a Buster Keaton uh, uh, no, atmosphere, uh, uh, that is very interesting. I remember um, a sentence from, uh, from uh, another philosopher, uh, Gilles Deleuze, who once said, uh, when uh, things uh, choose uh, to, uh, to be uh, useful, uh, they start to be, they start uh, simply to be. <laughs> no? it, yeah, it, that's a nice quote. Isn't it? Uh, and and, uh, and uh, this quote, uh, uh, Georgia, I think this quote we may, um, we may join uh, the other quote uh, by Manzoni himself. Uh, there is nothing, nothing to understand. Just, uh, just to, to be, just to, to be. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, beautiful, no? Just to, to live, just to, to be. And uh, to be, to be means uh, means uh, to be means uh, not to become uh, an hero, the great artist. I don't know um, a, a very important person. The to be means. Um, start uh, from the nothing, you start uh, from discarded things uh, and uh, gives uh, to those things um, uh, a value, no? Uh, as Fischl and Weiss, uh, they... I think that's a really beautiful quote for the ending of our presentation, Marco. Um, uh, maybe we can take questions now if there are any. Um, thank you all for listening and for being with us. Yeah. Uh, I have just received uh, a question about some explanation of uh, Simone Fatal and uh, uh, Pipilotti Rist uh, work at your back. Um, so this work by Pipilotti Rist um, is quite astonishing for many reasons. So of course, um, Pipilotti Rist is a sort of multimedia artist. She's a video pioneer. Um, she rarely works in a two-dimensional way. 
um, because the sort of immersion or the environment and haptics play a very important role in her work. This is, comes from a sort of first generation of uh, wood prints that she made because she was always sort of dissatisfied with the stillness of the video still. So if the video still is simply sort of printed in traditional manner, it loses its sort of animated character. So in order to sort of regain this movement or also to sort of give back organicity to the depicted organic body, Rist developed this technique of printing video stills onto wood. So as you see here, the wood is sort of worked on by means of a relief technique and then the video still is printed on it. So there are sort of two layers of tactility in this work. And then I forgot, ah, the second question, um, Simone Patal is represented here with two ceramic sculptures. She's an artist that is very much interested in the notion of memory, of origins. Um, she's originally from Syria. So these two sculptures are sort of emblematic for her practice. The one on the right hand side depicts a tree, the other one depicts a totem. Often her ceramic sculptures sort of bear the traces of her hands, of her working with sculptures. I always feel like when we see the artist's touch in a work, we also relate to that work by means of touch. Um, her sculptures are often very minimalistic and then there is always like one little detail that is sort of reminiscent or indicative of human form. In this case, for example, it is this mouth that we see here in this figure of the totem. Happy to answer more questions if there are. Uh, yes, there is a, one question uh, about the quote by Bryony Fair. Where does it come from? Do you? Um, so this quote by Brian Fair comes, I'm saying thing. I'm not sure, but it might come from an essay of hers about the Italian neo-avant-garde. Um, I can't really remember. I have the precise quote, but I'm happy to send that via email or anything if I can. In this case, I uh, would like very much to thank uh, Georgia and Marco for their extraordinary insights and contribution. And uh, I really invite uh, everyone to come to visit us in St. Moritz. Uh, the valley is beautiful. The exhibition is uh, breathtaking and we will be delighted to welcome you. Thank you for attending this uh, uh, walkthrough. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Georgia.